Major funding for this program was provided by the Program Fund of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by the Grotto Foundation. A bullet hole! A bullet hole! You got any food? Yeah, what do you want me to shoot down? In the pressure cooker of today's prisons, holding on to one's own inner spiritual identity can become the only way to stay alive. This is the story of American Indian prisoners who have returned to traditional religious practices in order to survive, both on the cell block and in the hole. In the prisons of this country, American Indian religious practices have almost always been misunderstood and in many instances forbidden. However, since the American Indian Freedom Religious Act was passed by Congress in 1978, Indian religious practices have the legal status of any other religion. Even today, however, suspicion remains. Indian spiritual advisors are not formally accredited as ministers and priests and always need special permission to conduct traditional religious practices in prison. Lame Deer is a traditional Indian spiritual advisor. He has come to help construct a sweat lodge and to lead prisoners in the traditional sweat ceremony. Thank you. The Sweat Lodge is the most significant to the Indian tribes in North and South and Central America or wherever there is Indian tribes. For the guys inside the prison system, it is really needed for rehabilitation purposes. The Indian has never been allowed to rehabilitate himself in his own spiritual world, in his own spiritual teachings and training. It has made a new outlook on life for those brothers that are inside the prison walls and also the sisters that are inside the prison walls. We have to teach the brothers inside the prisons what the sweat lodge is all about so that we may see our brothers on the outside not to be returning to these places. The sweat lodge, that's the only place, that's the only place where I know that two enemies can walk in there and come out as brothers. That's the only place I know. After the sweat lodge, I've been here for a while, and I started sweating. Uh, uh, it began to open new doors up for me. I began to gain a little more knowledge about myself. I gain a lot of wisdom every time I sweat. And uh, I get stronger each time. You know, it doesn't look like it when I come out, but I feel good. You know, I feel good about myself and about who I am. It's brought me in better touch with myself and with the surroundings around me. It means um, a purification, uh, a cleaning of, of, of evil thoughts, um, being, being closer to, to myself and, and being closer to grandfather, our, cre our creator. For me, it's given me a better outlook on life. This ceremony, I mean the sweat ceremony, being able to participate in it, being able to, to talk with, with people, brothers, I didn't even know the meaning of the sweat, sweat lodge. And until just recently, I've uh, discovered that it was a religion, which uh, I had forgotten all about.
we can keep the sweat lodge this high all the way through, it'd be nice. It'd be like Dennis Bank, it went up and looked like a missile going up. <laughs> <laughs> there are many things that many people do not know about. Many people always associate the sweat lodge as a glorified sauna. We use lava rocks and certain rocks that represent the earth that come inside the sweat lodge, and then when it does, it represents the fire. And it is mixed with the water, which when it mixes together, it creates steam, what we call grandfather's breath. Uh, sage is also used. There is a certain sage called a white sage. When you use it, it smells exactly like a marijuana. So our brothers inside the prisons get busted because of it. Yeah, you, you guys didn't make no tobacco ties, huh? We need 104 of them. <laughs> state contribution. All under the state expense. Last time it took us how many? Six hours? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Each one wanted to be the boss last time. Was <laughs> I got a couple in the house. Stuff. I should have brought a couple should've out. Should have brought pulleys blankets out of here. <laughs> 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 right. We go on yet. We still got the big canvas to come on yet. Yeah. That's good right there. I'm a Choctaw and I'm a traditional Indian. I speak my language. In our sweat lodge, I pray in my tongue. We sweat. The sweat lodge is the beginning and opening of all ceremony. What if it's your weepy ceremony? A Sundance ceremony, whatever ceremony, that's the beginning. You go in there and cleanse yourself, then go into other ceremonies. What makes me angry is when they disrespect what we respect, our sacredness, our eagle feathers, our pipe, our skull, and all that. They want to check it out like it's a weapon. Just sit right there facing out. Face out that way? Yeah. As with many sacred practices, the sweat lodge ceremony has its private aspect, and cameras and tape recorders are not allowed. The participants sit in a circle. Water is poured over the heated rocks. The intense heat from the steam, the passing of the sacred pipe, the prayers and songs together bring the people closer to the great spirit. One more coming. Let's get over. Let me get over this. Although he doesn't enter the sweat lodge, the fire tender's role as keeper of the sacred fire is the privileged position. Here in our sweat lodge, we sit on Mother Earth. We have four powers in there. We sit on Mother Earth. We bring the fire power, the red hot rocks inside. We bring the water power. Then we put the water and the steam, is that air. We put those four powers together inside there. You can't see that power, but you can feel it. The ceremonial pipe is sometimes called a peace pipe. It is a kind of movable altar and is assembled only when it is used in a ceremony. The pipe is like to a white man, it's a Bible, it's a Bible. We smoke our plants in there, our tobacco. The smoke goes up, there's the prayers that we send up. And they never understand that because to them, anybody could buy a pipe and smoke. They think we're still playing Indians. They don't see us as for real. We are from real from the beginning of time. We are still here. The spirit of the beginning is still here. We, we don't have one day out of a week to go to our creator or maker and pray and give thanks to him. We don't. We don't pray for ourselves. We're different from them because they, they do it in pitiful, sorry, shameful way. They get on their knees and hold their hand and pray, save me, save me, save me. All the Red Brothers, when they pray, they don't pray for themselves. They pray for others because another brother in that sacred circle is praying for you. He don't pray for himself. So everything in that sacred circle has been taken care of.
without you thinking of yourself. All my young days, it, they were all happy. It's all happy. And my grandmother's still still living today, you know. Still writes to me. She writes in my language. I understand, you know. We had simple prayers, like prayer for the plants, the animals, the trees. And she taught me how to pray, and I always prayed like that. Then when I grew up, I, I heard about uh, churches and I go in there and it was a whole different thing and I, that was there was a confusion right there because I was brought up in a traditional way of praying. I don't tell on my brothers. And they say, if I testify against my brother, I will be in prison. Here I am. Well, they had me for first degree murder, nine counts of attempt to commit murder. They knew who did it, but when I wouldn't testify, they put it all on me. They put the murder on me, and I went to jury trial. So they find me guilty and gave me seven, which uh, my release date next year at this time I will be out. I was thinking about going back to Oklahoma and you know let the little seed grow, you know, the seed grow, but then. You still have that little wild in you that still isn't really ready to settle. My grandmother raised me since I was a little baby on up to 12 years old. And she was always saying, I'm a man after I'm 12 years old. I'm on my own. You know, and I, I was scared to be 12 years old, but I was 12 years old. And I went to school there, played sports, got in all sports, did good. and. 15 years old, I went to Shilako Indian School, stayed there, and got to know the different tribes and different ways. Then when I turned 18, uh, the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, they signed up to go to L.A., so I stayed in L.A. as a welder. The only, only time you seen uh, big lights were on, in, in a newspaper, right? And I, I wanted to begin and get in and check it out, so I did. I went in and checked it out. I, I was in a clique. I went to the cheek hands. I was the only Indians. They called me Vato Indio Loco, right? And I, like I was just in L.A. and I'm 19 years old. When they gave me that name, hey, there I am, you know. Hey, that was a mean boy right there, you know. Hey, that was a low rider. See, I went through everything, but I grew out of that real quick, you know. I just seen you know, just fighting each other, you know, busting each other in a lip. And, we, we drunk a lot, but we talked about our old ways, how we was raised up, what we did, even though we was having that drink, you know, that, that drunk spirit, but we knew what we were doing, we knew what we was talking about. We were, we were probably the hardest one on the streets in L.A. Like I'm in my cell, locked up, I can look back and think, hey, it, it was a good hard road, but I tell you what, Nobody ever went through that road like I have, and I enjoyed it. I admit I was drunk once, but they're gonna slam you down and beat you in the head, you know? You know, and, you know. I seen that, I always seen that, you know? They, 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 they brought a lot of angry on you. Why, why do they do this, you know? A lot of these, these white winos are laying down drunk and everything, and the cops just go right over them, don't even say nothing. But then you get a red-skinned man that's there drunk, man, ain't bothering nobody. 
and, and he's too drunk even to fire, but the cops are going to slam him down, body slam him against the car and handcuff him. I used to observe, I used to check all these stuff out to see what they were doing. You start thinking way, way back to Calvary days, what, how they wore the same uniform as, uh, as what they did to your, your grand, grand ancestors, way back there, what they did to your ancestors. And that's just what they did to me. That's the way I seen what they did. They they have no no feelings for you whatsoever. Once they got that blue uniform on, Calvary, let's ride. You know, and it's, it's a pity the way they are. That's the way I look at them. If the sweat lodge wouldn't hear, the sweat lodge wouldn't hear, and I couldn't sweat in the sweat lodge. Hey, I, I'd probably be locked up, man, because, you know, like, I, you know, I wouldn't listen to nobody, you know, and I would, I would probably have a lot of hatred. That's the only thing that controls me. Maybe I'm mad, maybe I'm angry, maybe something's bothering me. I go in a swear lodge and I conduct the swear lodge. Hey, that's new me. That, that, that old Sonny, that, that one was mad when there, was that angry in his heart. Hey, he, he ain't no more, man. He got vanished while he was in there. He came out feeling good and feeling happy, you know? And that's me speaking, you know? Nothing else can make me feel that way, even running under the sun. much on a reservation, you know. Uh, when I was a small kid, I, I can remember living back there with my mom and dad, Montana. And uh, we only lived back there a couple years. Of, and from there, they moved to Portland. I grew up in Portland. I went to school and high school there. And as far as knowing any thing about my heritage, uh, uh, culture and religious ways of uh, my people, I knew nothing. I grew up <laughs> as a Catholic, you know. Uh, I was ignorant about what it is to be an Indian, how hard it is to be an Indian. I didn't respect things that my people respect. In fact, in reality, I was ashamed to be an Indian. In school, you have different types of group. You have what they call soch, you know, the rich, you know, the mid upper middle class, and they have the hoods, the greasers, you know. And uh, I hung with them, you know, being an Indian, you know, I wasn't accepted into the upper middle class, you know. So I naturally went where I was accepted, you know. And then uh, did what they did, you know, what my next door neighbor did, next thing, uh, I graduated from there to the juvenile home. Well, I started my career in a juvenile home, uh, burglary and little things, and off on the bad road. And all this time, I knew nothing of my Indian religion. I'm living a completely different life. And then I started with the drugs. I did pulled some bank robberies, and I was in different federal penitentiaries. And I got out, and you were programmed to come back, more or less. Uh, there was no help. Uh, then I pulled arm robbery and I canned it up here again. Who's that? Wait, When I first came here, I was lost. And uh, none of this was. Uh, for me, you know, it was all about getting back out and hitting them nightclubs. That was my fault. I, I lived to be out there and be able to dance, drink, drive new cars, get high and nod out or whatever I wanted to do. I was completely lost. But I'm not lost anymore. Should I have another piece for this? Now that we have our sweats, we have our pipe. Uh, I know who I am and I, I'm proud of who I am. <laughs> I 
I had to come to prison to learn, you know, who I am and what I am. Uh, I came here in uh, 1974. Uh, we had the pipe at that time, but I didn't participate in, you know, it was foreign to me, you know, to pick up the pipe. Uh, I was so used to picking up the Bible, you know. I knew absolutely nothing about the pipe and how sacred it was to our people. Like, I didn't know anything about the sweat lodge until I come here, too. Uh, well, I was born on a, on a former Klamath reservation, and our, Klamath, and our reservation was terminated in 1961. And the, the Indian people on my reservation was uh, pretty well assimilated to uh, Dhamma society. Uh, a lot of our culture and ways of life uh, were taken away from us. Uh, he was programmed to, to be like the European or the white man. Uh, and I knew that something was wrong. I had black hair and dark skin, you know. But uh, I was acting like a white man, so, so I was kind of lost, too. I was educated by the system. I learned to read. And the more books I read, uh, the more angry I got, you know, about the Indian people, you know, what the people, Europeans did to us, uh, to my ancestors. Uh, I think a lot of us Indian people fight that 400-year-old war, uh, coming over here, taking our land and taking our minnows and uh, hurting Mother Earth. I didn't know how to deal with that. Then I came to a penitentiary when I was 18 years old for uh, killing an Indian brother over a drunken argument. Uh, and this only uh, added to the pain that was within me. Uh, then I, after I came to prison, I used to lay down in segregation for uh, weeks at a time and create some more bitterness and hatred within me. It finally got out of balance. I hated everything. I hated guards. I hated white people. I hated black people. I hated the system. I hated everything. And this went on for another 13 years, and I ended up taking another life. And uh, I killed a bartender, and I got a life sentence out of that. And that happened in uh, 1973. After coming to the penitentiary in 1973, I began getting into uh, the Indian culture in a way of life. I learned a lot in the last nine years of talking to spiritual people, sweating, pipe ceremony. We live across the river on the reservation, what they call across the river. There's a river that runs through and on our side, we're the Yahuskin Band of Snake Indians, which lived across the river. And my grandmother had a sweat lodge, which was made of canvas. And I would help her, because she had a lot of sons, but they were out doing their thing. So we lived primitive. We had outside toilets, no running water. You got your water from the well. but. It seemed like we were all happy, horseback riding. Then later, I was just uh, transported from that environment to the Catholic school. And then i kind of forgotten all about home because I was there for four years. And let's say I grew up there in that environment, uh, learning their ways, forgetting I even had any other ways. When I went into DTs, the Catholic religion was the only thing that I had to fall back on to help me. I was in a room by myself with the water dripping from the shower and day and night until that just d d threw me up the wall there. I was climbing the walls. I wanted to get out of there. 
when I was a kid of 13, I committed a crime, which I don't recall at all. I, I don't remember. I had electric shock treatments when I was 13 years old. They blanked part of my memory out. I was sentenced to three and a half years in Alderson, West Virginia. And I wound up doing another three years in uh, Washington, D.C. So, I mean, I think that I was mistreated. But at the time, there wasn't anything I could do. I got seven years. I've been here uh, since August the 20th. I got this job because uh, I didn't have anything to do at first when I came here. I felt too. Means that you were at the wrong place at the right at their right time. <laughs> Victim of circumstances. Uh, as the saying goes, <laughs> they framed me. I think for seven years, you have to be here about six months before you go before the parole board. I think a lot of Indians have a problem with alcohol and drugs. And I don't think that any abuse and tranquilizers are helping anybody. I think that Indian religion is the answer to the Indians' problems with alcohol. I feel like it helped me. And I think if we learn our own culture and our own religion, that this would help more than anything. The Indian people need their own culture back that they took away from us. Born and raised down in Pyramid Lake till about five. And then we moved to Reno. And from Reno, I started going to school in Stuart Indian School. And I went there for 10 years. Then after I got out of there about, when I was in about the 10th grade, that's when I started uh, drinking, started running around. And after I got into the booze, I ended up coming here. Then after I've been here about four years ago, I got involved into the sweat. And what the sweat has did for me was learned a lot by controlling myself, my attitude, my mind, how it works. I can see what I didn't see when I was younger. It's gotten me away from the booze to where I can say no, I don't want it no more. Which I don't, it's gotten me closer to my family, my wife, everything got me thinking different, gave me a more wider view on life to where I can understand it, and I'm still understanding a lot. The brothers that goes there with you and they're behind you all the way, that what you do and what you say in the sweat, they give you all the support you need. They give you help. And what you don't understand, there's anywhere from five to 15 people in, our, in a sweat with us that would help us. And they all have something to say, so one of them would give up a pretty strong suggestion on how I would go about quitting or how I would get a little more support with all the rest of the brothers in a the sweat. They'd give up a little support on that. And you'd get a better understanding towards yourself and towards the other people. Oh. I'm here for grand larceny, and I'll be expiring in about, I don't know, about a year, I guess, something like that. And when I get out of here, I'll be continuing going on to the sweats. My grandpa was nicknamed King. Uh, and he was a king, <laughs> a chief. 
this sort of thing. Um, had a hard life. Come from a big family. Nowadays, there isn't any way, any way near Indian the ways the way we are living today back then can't compare it and say Indian there aren't no horses around there aren't no cattle around everybody's living in a one of these um, fabricated assembled houses nothing um, my life is pretty good. We had a lot of hard times, but we all, we all faced them together. My grandma used to always talk Indian to all of us. And um, my grandpa, my Lala. I picked up on a lot of this when praying traditionally. I started drinking when I was very young. I had gone away to school and... Uh, it was a, lo a long way from, a long way from home, and I, I seen a lot of my roommates, dorm mates, all doing it, and no one twisted my arm. I wanted to, and my first drink was wine, and I, I was told it was vodka, <laughs> and it was um, a homecoming night. I landed in the hospital, I landed in jail. And that was like when I think I was about 16 years old. I, I just remember drinking that day. I just remember drinking. And, um, damn. And it makes me uneasy to talk about it because I can't remember. I couldn't defend myself in my trial either because I, I had no knowledge of what had gone on. But it's all alcohol related. I just, I just, um, from what I gather, one of my brother-in-laws had gotten hit in the head with a bat. And myself was, I was sober. I don't think I would have did anything while I was drunk. I guess I just had to get in the battle too. Because he is a brother-in-law I favor. I was there and there was a feud between a woman and a man. And, uh, I somehow got myself involved. Uh, I had um, stabbed a guy four times. And uh, according to the my PSI paper report, um, the coroner said the guy would have lived had he gone to the hospital. Um, he more or less drowned in his own blood, I guess. It was real hard for me to talk about this. I can't get over what I did. So no matter where I've gone, I've always gotten along great with people. Um, something that really bothered me about the thing was, about my crime was, when I was being questioned, they asked me if I would, out of a picture of three men, would I recognize the man? When they showed me this picture, I couldn't show them who the guy was that was supposed to that I was supposed to have murdered. I couldn't pick him up. I didn't know who he was. My sentence was for five years of voluntary manslaughter from second degree murder. I couldn't believe murder behind my name, a number, shackled, tight, handcuffs, shoved around. A one block, a one block, I call four. Mushy Malak, Mushy Malak, Roya. Now, let Takuni 
Ich habe mich nicht. Ich habe mich nicht. Ich habe People have talked to me and couldn't believe this crime I'm in here for because I was supposed to have come from a good family. No. No, this. Frank, if you got a little bit of white over there and some dark brown. All right. Some dark, I so. I started when I was in grade school. I saw a picture I wanted to draw to see if I could draw. And it turned out not too bad, so I entered it in an art contest and I got an honorable mention on it. Ever since then, I, you know. Myself, I didn't start until the summer of 76. My art teacher couldn't believe I could draw and she thought, that Lloyd had did it. She says, your brother did this, didn't he? I told her, no, I did it. And she goes, really? And I go, yeah, I'll show you. You know, and I said, I started drawing a picture. And she said, wow, you really can do it, you know? And uh, ever since I've been going, I uh, entered five of the first drawings that I did in art festival. And I got three first place ribbons and two second place ribbons and a, a best of art show ribbon. So I've been going ever since. In the last five years that we've been down, you know, my brother taught me how to draw in colors, and we both been going ever since. Just been kicking them out left and right. There was our family and one other family that were the Indian families that lived in Caliani. So uh, we didn't let anybody tell us what to do. Sure, a lot of older guys always kicked our butts. White guys, um, white mostly guys. white dude. That's where we grew up in, in a white society. That. They call you Hiawatha and Renegade and Savage. And... Tonto and this and that. <laughs> so uh, we told them, all right, yeah, that's cool. As we started getting older, we started getting tougher and tougher. And then they started leaving us alone. We did our own thing, like sniff paint, do gasoline, uh, do what our friends were doing naturally. A lot of them was into it, so we got into it until we broke into schools, broke into churches. Uh, just for kicks, for something to do. So we got busted one time for stealing all kinds of tools and stuff out of a trailer house. They arrested us and took us straight to Elko, to the boys' school. Well, after we got out of the boys' school, there was a period of about maybe five years. And he went his way and I went mine. Well, I come back to Caliani and we got together again, you know. And just started partying all over again. Well, my brother and I are both partiers. We was when we was on the streets. We did nothing but went out with girls, uh, drank all the time, uh, and did drugs, you know, mostly marijuana. And uh, we uh, enjoyed it. You know, any, any time we could get some money, the town was so small anyway, Callahan, for example. And we uh, had nothing to do. Couldn't get no work, there's no jobs. We were looking for kicks. I, I threw a rock at the cop car. Uh, go ahead and tell them what you know. More well, about we'd started drinking about, oh, it must have been about, what, six, seven in the evening after I got off of work. And Van and I, and Frank. We have a good friend named Van Garcia. Well, he'd been beaten by this officer. We did a few things that we didn't intend to do, like hit a cop car and, you know, things like that. But when my partner was arrested, I talked to my brother and told him what had happened. I started telling Lloyd, man, we got to find out what's wrong with Ben. We got to find out what's wrong with Ben, you know, after he told me what had happened, see. And uh, I, I had anger in me at the time, you know, but I wanted to know if he was all right or not. So we went and got guns, and we're going to go down to the police station and find out how bad our, our friend was. And in case this cop decided he wanted to do the same thing to us, that is, that's the reason we had the guns. So we went in, and I went into one part of the jailhouse, and Frank went into the judge's chambers. 
And while I was in the jailhouse, I heard shooting. I, I, I went in and I told him, all right, hold it right there, you know. Don't, don't make any sudden moves, you know. I had the gun pointed on him. And I told the policeman, what did you do that to Van Garcia for? You know, I was cussing at him. And before I could finish that sentence, his gun was coming around and there was flames shooting out of his gun this far. And I was shooting through the doorway and he was shooting at me, you know. And it just a couple matter of seconds, all this happened. And I seen him fall over on his side. When he called me, I knew that Frank was shot. And I didn't know if the cop had been shot or not. And the next thing I know, they arrested us for capital murder because the cop ended up dying. He just ended up being killed. Well, well after I sobered up, I come to realize that, God, what did I do last night, you know? Well, the jury come back uh, with a verdict of uh, second degree murder. And uh, the judge gave us the maximum for life with five years to the first board. And uh, that was the outcome of it. I feel that we had a fair trial. And we come away with better than what we expected. We're going on our sixth year now. When we first got here, we uh, pretty much did what we wanted to do. And we weren't very much in contact with the Indian people here on the yard. We didn't know anybody. And they come in contact with us, and they started asking us, well, would you like to uh, participate in some of the things we do? And it sounded interesting to me, because I'd never really known anything like it. And the further I got into it, the better I liked it. It shows me that I can do what I want to do and that there is somebody watching over us, not necessarily a human form or what, but from the things that I've gone through, it can't be nothing else. It makes me feel like we can do things, we can accomplish things when we have to. And I, I know one thing, it's, it's made me a better man because I, I know I don't want to go back to the life I led when I was out before. And there's no way I'd, I don't want to go back to that. I'd like for us to become known as American Indian artists, to be able to depict dancers, feather dancers, animals, Indian. Our heritage. Yeah, our heritage. Our moms always told us to be proud as Indians. What is it? Oh, man. Well, here, help yourselves to that there. So one scoop Where's two scoops? Two scoops. two scoops, if they want to leave us, all right. Two scoops. Two scoops of raisins and a cow You got any raisins in there? Get busy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> When I first learned how to sweat, it was after I started my moon. I was 10 years old. The sweat lodge was built for maybe four women, and it was built up by a creek which ran right by. And I didn't like it at first. But as I sweated every week with my grandmother and my aunt, and it became part of my life, I didn't understand, but they explained to me little by little. I was um, born and raised on the Klamath Modoc Reservation for about seven years. That was with my mother. And then I moved to Hoopa, California, and lived about eight years um, with my father. And then my mother had remarried and moved to Portland, Oregon with my four brothers. And so coming from a, an Indian background, being more or less isolated, most reservations are, going to school with cousins, brothers, whatnot, 
uh, we moved to Portland, or I moved to Portland, and um, was enrolled in an all-white school. I had no friends. I had no brothers. Um, I had nobody. And I was angry at everybody. I didn't want to be there in the first place. I found that um, being tossed in a white society wasn't easy. I was ridiculed, and I fought a lot. It just went from bad to worse. I was eight months pregnant with my second child, and my husband um, tried to kill me and my daughter. Um, not the baby that was already born, the baby that I was carrying. Um, so I left him, and that was five years ago. And um, I was, he had a lot of money when we were married, so I was accustomed to better things. So in order to keep my apartment and, and clothe my babies and give them the best, I had to not only work, but I started dealing um, cocaine, heroin, dilatas, weed, amphetamines, everything. I was not using none of the stuff, not yet. So two years later, after my baby turned about three, um, uh, I started um, um, shooting cocaine. I was shooting cocaine really bad. I probably weighed about 98 pounds, and somebody turned me on to some heroin, and that was that. From then on, it was a, almost two years of a heavy heroin addiction. I just didn't care anymore. When you use dope, you always have to go and, and get that fix, to have that little bit of money, that fix. It's all you think about. So I gave up on everything else. I gave up on my kids, I gave up on my family, I gave up on everything. So I went into forgeries, and um, they caught me with 30,000. They convicted me for three felonies. Then I was sentenced to five years here. Um, when I first was busted, I was a junkie. When I kicked in jail, I thought I was going to die. I wanted to die. Everything came back to me, my grandmother my heritage, my spirit. Everything came back to me then. Um, in the prison, you find a lot of anger, you find a lot of depression, you find a lot of hostile feelings around you at all times. There's always tension. You can feel the tension. When I have a sweat, and when my friends sweat with me, um, we're as one. When we go in as mad at each other or whatever, we come out as one. We're not mad at each other because all that aggression, all that anger has been drained and we can be at peace with ourselves. The sweat lodge has been tore down about three weeks ago and has not been put back up and there has been no attempt to be put back up. That's what makes me mad. If they need somebody for this to be built back up, I would do it myself. They just don't care. Out on the streets, you know, I'd be sweating maybe every three days, maybe every week. Whenever I felt I needed it, I know some of my privilege have been stripped away because I'm in prison. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that I have to give up my heritage, too. They expect me to lay down. They expect me to give up. I've been fighting since the day I was born, and I refuse to give up. Uh, the pipe was brought to penitentiary in 1974, and it took us about a year, I guess, uh, to get it approved by the prison administration. We had to have a chemical test on a connectic, or the tobacco that we use in a the pipe. They wanted to check it out to see if it had any kind of narcotics in there where we could get high. But also, they thought that a pipe may be used to smoke marijuana in it. Different things like this we had to deal with. Grandfather to the south, from whence the warm, wind, warm winds come. This is for you. To you, grandfather. Welcome, Tonka, to Koshla. Join the sacred circle today, grandfather. And this tobacco is for you. And this. Final bit of tobacco here it's for the way, the ways that we know that have been given to us. The 
After the prison administration found out that we were sincere about our pipe ceremony, we ran into another problem, and that was having spiritual leaders come in here to lead the pipe. So we had to submit a proposal to bring spiritual leaders in here. And when we first started out, several times they were denied because a spiritual leader doesn't have documentation like a chaplain or a priest. So as time went on, uh, I, this one medicine man, our spiritual man, used to come in and, and visit me, you know, to kind of help me deal with the problem in here. So uh, the medicine man told me that uh, to have pity on this on the guards, you know, because uh, if they had the knowledge uh, that we have, uh, then they wouldn't uh, be making fun of our, our feathers, which was, you know, pretty simple when you think about it. I had to run back to the cell block a while ago, and I run back to pick up my eagle feather, you know, because I bring it down to a sweat. And I was coming through the control room floor when the uh, officer says, what are you doing with that pigeon feather? He said. I said, yeah, it's a big pigeon, I said. And he says, uh, is that an eagle feather? And I said, no, it's a pigeon feather, I said. <laughs> you know? And, you know, without me getting mad at them for something, for uh, an ignorant remark that they make towards something that I value, um, I go about my way. And the eagle feather to us is sacred. It's a sacred bird. Uh, we, we take, we have much pride in having the eagle feather. Uh, we pray with the eagle feather. The sweat lodge was brought in here in January 1979. And it took us four years to get it in here. Uh, when I go into a sweat, I go back inside myself and deal with different problems that, that bothers me, like hatred and paranoia and jealousy. A lot of people go into sweat and they, they pray for their immediate family. And as time went on, grandfather gave me a little more knowledge and I expand that immediate family to, to the Klamath tribe. And as time went on, it went to the Klamath tribe to the end of the nation. And from the Indian nation, it went on to the black person, the, the black people, and then the white people. And then it went on to the wing people. And I expanded on to the four-legged, and then the trees, and expanded on to the grass, the clouds. And, and right now, my immediate family is all creation. I am. Uh, I have a son, 14, and I have a daughter, 13. I haven't been with them much because I've been in the penitentiary. Uh, my son, he asks a lot about me because I'm his father, you know. He's, in a way, he's, he says, I want to be just like you, you know. I tell him, no, you don't, you know. Uh, you can, but you can't, you know. Uh, but he, he's at that age now where you know, he comes here and he visits me, you know. Uh, and he asks questions, you know. And it's good that he asks questions because I want to teach him, you know. I want to teach him, you know, he knows he's Indian, you know. Uh, you know, and it's, that's something he, he's proud of, you know. And, and he says that to me. He knows I sweat every weekend and he wants me to teach him about the sweat lodge. The sweat brings the Indian brother to realize who he is, what he is, it teaches him respect, to love his brother rather than to be jealous of him, and to help one that is in trouble. He may not be of your tribe, but you help him, he's your brother. And that's what's going on here now. The only time brothers get in an argument is on the basketball court when they play buffalo ball, they call it. They don't call it basketball, it's buffalo ball. Before then, you might have to worry about going out to the yard, end up in a fight before you leave. It was one of your own brothers. There was a lot of uh, jealousy amongst each other, a lot of violence, trying to prove one's status. Uh, one wants to be tougher than the other, and one's better than the other. And uh, You see prison on TV, you gotta be tough. You gotta be the kind. I think having the sweat lodge and the, the pipe 
and spiritual leaders coming inside has done more for the Indian people inside. It has done more than anything else I've seen in the penitentiary do. Without the sweat and without the sacred pipe, uh, we would leave and we would undoubtedly come back, you know, again and again. This program was produced by Twin Cities Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for this program was provided by the Program Fund of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by the Grotto Foundation.